I think it's a good time probably to start with introduction. Could you describe what are you doing recently? Because I think right now you're working somehow with quantum technologies, if I'm not mistaken. Yeah. Uh, hi, everyone. I'm Artem, Artem Nikitin. Uh, I'm a physicist who moved to, to industry. So uh, I did study physics in, in Moscow. Yeah, quantum matter physics. Then I moved to Amsterdam to do a PhD in experimental uh, physics. So I did a lot of experiments at low temperatures, superconductors, and yeah, published some papers. It was quite fun. And that's actually Amsterdam is is a, is a place where I met you, Sergey. Yeah, yeah, indeed. Yeah. So then, after my PhD, I moved for a postdoc position in Switzerland, in Paul Scherer Institute. <laughs> Where I was doing uh, experimental physics, yeah, uh, using some particles like muons. I was doing scattering on on superconductors and magnets. And then after that, I went to to China for a very short postdoc in Beijing. And then very soon after I moved to China, I found a nice job in in the Netherlands in Delft, in a company called Dell Circuits where the guys, they do hardware for quantum computers. So I joined them. And since then I, I'm here and uh, having a lot of fun with uh, quantum hardware. Technologies. Yeah, hardware for quantum technologies. It's nice. I think I didn't know that you have such a long uh, career, long, lots of step in your career. So, and right now you're working with Quantum technologies? Can we say that in the sense that is it like yeah. really quantum technologies? Well, I'm I'm actually helping the quantum research and sub we're supplying them with the with the hardware. So we make uh, special tools like uh, cables and filters, some electronic components for those who are actually trying to build quantum computers. So our customers or let's say our friends who are using our equipment. Are uh, the professors in uh, universities or national laboratories or corporations who actually work in quantum? But we also, in the company, we have quite some expertise in, in quantum technologies, especially in the hardware part, especially our founders and few engineers. And I, I myself, I have, let's say, general knowledge in, in, in quantum physics, also learning more and more about some particular parts. Yeah. And yeah, we are also located in. Technical University of Delft, which has a good reputation in, in quantum computation, and uh, there is some sort of a support there, so we are not coming from nowhere. So there is a yeah. kind of logical step towards. And actually, there are many more now companies start to uh, appearing in the Technical University of Delft to outsource some of the tasks which quantum engineers uh, do not want to spend their time on. Mm. It's it's still like quite interesting to me that when you say quantum engineering, quantum technology, I'm inside myself. I'm a bit surprised that it's already like a product which is delivered because for me, quantum technology is still a thing which is supposed to live in a lab. And then somebody tells me, oh, you know, it's already like a product which is delivered to companies. Okay, mm -hmm. maybe just a university research lab. I'm still a bit surprised. Like, oh, wow, it's already no. like delivering. So, and yeah, you know, so my, yeah. yeah. So it's actually, I was also surprised uh, kind of two years ago when I was diving into that uh, in more details. So the, the thing is that uh, quantum computation, for example, is now transforming from science to technology. So there is already, the, there is a step, big step done there in terms of uh, choosing the platform or realizing the, let's say, the basic hardware to, to make sure that it's actually working. So researchers in the world, they demonstrated that uh, quantum computation is no longer a science fiction, but it's actually working uh, machine. So you can do even today already some calculations, maybe very basic, very simple. It's not like super powerful yet today, but there is a big potential and this potential is transforming from the laboratories to corporations. Yeah. And this we can see it by those who are actually funding to give money to these projects. So in the past, let's say in 10 years, 10 years ago, there were only governments who were supporting this kind of research. <clears throat> let's see. Yeah. yeah. Countries or governments, gov government funds. Yeah. But today, there is a big fraction of private money going there. 
So there are many corporations which are investing their own private money yeah. because, uh, and these corporations, they, they are not, uh, they're not investing for nothing, right? So yeah, if yeah. the corporation starts investing something, yeah. they want something in return. So yeah. it means there is a break, the break point has been done already in, at least in the minds of the you know, people who make decisions, let's say the high profile managers in corporations that they can calculate the profit out of that in the future. So it means there is a potential there and it is happening today, right yeah. now it is happening. It's, it's, it's actually quite interesting point because when do you think it happened? Because in my mind, it was always research labs who work with quantum technologies, but then it's, is it like something happened or it was a smooth transition like from the labs to industry? Because I don't remember like specific point in time when it was like, okay, now we're going to do technology real industrial things. Because for me, it seems like it's a smooth transition from the lab and people say, okay, now we see that this technology is more or less ready to leave the lab. Let's start to make sort of a startup out from it or like a spin-off company. Mm -hmm. So this is in my perspective what's going on, but I'm still kind of surprised that, okay, it's it's really technology with, with like uh, leaving the lab and coming to like commercial products, but still I think it's the customers of these products are really special, let's say research labs, uh, some maybe engineers who are really interesting in very small subjects. So is it, I think the market right now is not so big, no? Yeah, well, there are a few questions in your question. Yeah. And yeah, let's let's go step by step. Yeah. Uh, first of all, the transition is smooth, that's for sure. Every transition is kind of smooth in our world, okay, except some uh, uh, phase, phase transitions uh, of second order. But yeah. <laughs> well, this is too complicated. <laughs> yeah, but we, we normally live in, in, in a smooth transition. And the corporations, they started investing already. I don't know, 10, 15 years ago, like yeah. uh, big companies like Microsoft, they start funding labs in Delft or in Copenhagen. And then IBM was slowly getting into the projects. So they were just maybe giving small portions of, of money to see what's happening. But uh, after uh, maybe a couple of years ago, there was uh, a big announcement Yeah, in 2019, actually. So exactly one year ago, Google mm -hmm. published a very big paper about quantum supremacy. So they claim that they can do some calculations better than conven conventional computer. And then, in fact, there is a res big research group similar to university group working at Google, but they were able to not only to build the, the machine, let's say, but also run the software. So they create software and run some calculations and they demonstrated that basically all fundamental problems have been solved today, or not today, 2020 in the last year. It's quite a statement. Yeah, so the, it was already big push saying that, okay, guys, it's still kind of pre-technology, it's still research, but we can make a hardware plus software in a way that it works together and can solve problems. And since that, I think that was one of the break, break point where like many corporations start started to rethink their budgets and rethink yeah. their strategy to say, okay, now we have to invest there. Yeah. Yeah, so it's, it's it actually, was, yeah, so, but, I, and, and now it's, 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 it's interesting sort of time because some companies already saying, okay, we're ready to invest, but I think, do you think the technology is already here to go to the real world? Because I think the problem which is solved right now, they're really specific problems. It's not like we solve, typical problems from chemistry, biology, or something like that. We're still solving very technical, very, very challenging problems, that, but they're very technical and they're really specific tasks. Like they're more showing that, yes, there is a supremacy from the quantum side, but it's really on very specific tasks, right? Yes. And it, it will remain like this for some time uh, because the, the, the com computational power of quantum computer, computers is still a very challenging technical uh, problem. So to, to make it big and let's say scalable, it will require a lot of engineers, researchers from all over the world working on that. <clears throat> but uh, what's what's important is, is there is no fundamental uh, physical problem, let's say, to which will stop from scaling. For example, we can do today on a very small scale on, let's say, few qubits, qubits is a quantum bits, <laughs> to solve, let's say, one simple equation. Yeah. And this has been demonstrated. 
And you can compare it with the, let's say, state of computers in the uh, early, I don't know, 50s or 60s, where the, let's say, uh, calculations were done, very simple calculations were done in the very big, expensive machines. But there was no doubt already at that time that, <laughs> that they can change the, the calculations for forever. So there is no real fundamental issue to stop, let's say, growing uh, the quantum computation. There are some technical problems there which have to be solved. And this, these problems are solvable. Let's say we know we tackle our company, we tackle one of the problem. And then there are many other companies tackling other problems. But in the end, the scale to make the quantum computer bigger and more powerful is no longer a science problem. So yeah. it, it is engineering problem today. And that's that's understanding already in the heads of many people. And uh, I'm also believing in that. So I see that in, in uh, I don't know, in a few years, maybe a few decades, in the worst case, uh, mm -hmm. these engineering problems will be solved. So then we can use uh, the capacity and the power of quantum computers mm -hmm. in, uh, in a full scale, let's say in, yeah. a, in, a, in a big, uh, for, to solve big equations, big yeah. problems. And what it seems to me when you say it, in my perspective, how this quantum technology, quantum world is working right now, there are lots of, not lots of, but there are a few small companies and maybe a few big players. And now they putting efforts together to build the quantum computers to reality. And in the sense that everybody is working on a small problem, but then we need like a common effort to really build a quantum computer. What I think is missing right now, at least in my eyes, that there are a few companies which are working on very dedicated things, which are doing very specific tasks, and they're very cool, they're very important, the challenges is very really difficult, but there is, I don't see like a common ground when the quantum computers really become a one machine, you know? You see what I'm saying? Mm -hmm. It's kind of like yeah. different research labs, they're working under their umbrellas, and sometimes they're looking a bit out of this umbrella and see what other people are doing, but there is no like common ground when people say, okay, we have a problem of quantum computing, we have to address, let's say, 10 challenges, and now let's distribute these challenges between 10 labs and see what's happening. I think right now, what I see at least is just everybody's pulling the blanket, and it seems like, again, I don't see a common ground. That's what yeah. it's suspicious to me. I mean, you're right, and Partially, there is still kind of a competition within architectures of quantum computation. So let's see, uh, let's separate them in in few parts. So there are, let's say, um, quantum computer can be realized on different architectures. So one of them is superconducting uh, qubits. Another one is ion traps. Then there is like <clears throat> silicon. Yeah. And then there is uh, another way of of doing that. Basically, what has happened in the past that one research group tackled one problem in, in this domain and then another research group was tackling another problem in this research domain or architecture. And then within architectures, there are also some other splits, which, yeah. which let's say, problems have to be tackled. And I, I agree that there is no one united uh, corporation or group which can tackle all of them at the same time. So what is happening now, let's say, uh, Google or IBM say that we're working on superconducting part and they're competing within that range already. Then there is another company called Honeywell. They say we're working in ion traps. We're going to solve that particular part. Then there is Intel who is really good in silicon mm. and they, they produce chips on silicon today. They say we're going to adapt our technology, which we know a lot already and try to get quantum there. Mm. So there is already a split in the roles in the, in the chain <clears throat> at least from integration point of view, because as we can imagine, like one company cannot solve everything, that's for sure, and one university also cannot solve everything. But what they do, for example, as a big corporations, they try to tackle the biggest challenge there, for example, the chip. So chip is one of the biggest challenges to make working uh, uh, bits, right? Working qubits where the calculation itself uh, is, is <laughs> calculating, <laughs> is yeah. done. Yeah, so this problem is kind of tackling by big guys, or we call them integrators. But then there are also other players in, for example, supply chain. So that's Dell Circus company is in the supply chain. So we supply some components. 
the, there is a simple example is the the computer or cell phone yeah we have yeah. a cell phone everyone so we know that some companies produce sell us cell phones but it doesn't mean that this one company like apple produce everything inside so they know okay today maybe they produce even chips but cameras they outsource microphones they outsource they outsource metallic shielding they outsource uh, a screen and mm. stuff like this so what's happening now with the quantum computing integrators like a big guys like big corporations so they want to be the end product with maybe some core components inside but everything else they would love to outsource because it's not their core business and just they want to get a product here and there okay. for example uh, so the uh, the integration platform for superconducting uh, quantum computing computers is the refrigerator. Basically, everything has to yeah. be very cold. And yeah. we know that superconducting chip works at very low temperatures. So, and refrigerators, you can just buy. And there are many companies, maybe not so many, but less yeah. than 10 for sure, which can produce very big and powerful refrigerators. And this is already one component in supply chain. Of course, they modify yeah. them, make it bigger or according yeah. to specs. Then there is, there are, let's say, at least three more components. One is the electronics at room temperature. Yeah. So that's the one which controls the, the signals going to the chip. And then something is happening with the signal and goes out. Then you have to read it. So it's uh, yeah. input, input signals. Then uh there, there is a low temperature part so like at low temperature electronics that's another yeah. different ball game there and there are many players who are supplying these kind of uh, components and, and the, the one is, is, is the point here is that all of these technologies up to now they are not really quantum it's really like a good refrigerator good electronics is just an electronics a refrigerator for now there is nothing quantum right well yes and no Yes, that they're not super quantum, at least they were not quantum at the point where the quantum computing didn't didn't become a, let's say, buzzword, but they were still making uh, good refrigerators. Okay. What What is the adaptation, for example, for quantum is to make it bigger, okay. to make it more powerful. And this is also a challenging task. Yeah. It's, it's required a lot of uh, engineering problems. So, But that's why I'm telling you that the... the, the the problem of quantum computing today is no longer a scientific problem. It's an engineering problem. So this company, which has sold fridges for 50 years, they just need to adapt it, make it powerful and bigger, and maybe get more space inside that you can put more electronics inside. So it's solvable. Of course, I mean, there are some, let's say, end parameters where you can do it larger than the, our planet, for example. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But there are many other aspects, for example, electronics at low temperature. Okay, we had uh, electronic in the past, electronics in the past, which worked pretty good at uh, room temperature, for example, for telecom, right? Yeah. So just one, one, one reminder here that uh, quantum computing chips, at least superconducting ones, they work at the uh, high frequencies kind of yeah. similar to frequencies you use in your smartphone for communication. Yeah. So we have good solutions which are working at room temperature. Yeah. But to make sure that we have good antennas, good, uh, I don't know, amplifiers and stuff like this working as the same good, the same quality as room temperature, that this thing should go to low temperatures, that requires some modification in material choice, modification in... Uh, size in form factor yeah. and this also problems which uh, are not fundamentally difficult to solve of course they, they require yeah. a lot of work but in the end it is possible to modify them and put them into cryostat and yeah. this is what is happening today yeah. and these problems can be solved and then companies call themselves quantum and stuff like this but they they kind of adapting the yeah like solutions. a standard yeah so they're pretty much adapting the standard let's say electronical solution optical solution and they really make it more robust better performance and then really the word quantum becomes really a thing that's what i that's what i think actually is happening because we used to have let's say optical design optical manufacturing electronic design manufacturing things like that and now it just becomes more advanced more challenging and sometimes i feel like the word quantum is overused because there is nothing quantum in this technology but it just it's very advanced technology it's it's very nicely done it's very robust but there is nothing really quantum into it it just it's very good technology but 
sometimes it's what my feeling. Sometimes the word quantum is overused to make it a bit more fancy. At least it, it, it's I, I'm not against it. It, it. Just to me, it sounds a bit. It, it's a bit more fancy, but I have no like hard to, to hard problems well, to yeah. say that. I mean, uh, some companies, especially I, I I understand that some companies they use this to get a buzz. For it's, it's it was the same with crypto, right? In a few years ago, where they like everything was Bitcoin or crypto stuff, so just to get more money. And in a way, this we see it also this bubble. Some companies are behaving like a, a bubble and trying to get more attention because of they position themselves in a, in a, in a quantum uh, computer hardware supply chain. But there are some, let's say, good companies. In the end, the, 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 those who make a, a good solutions and good products, yeah. they will survive in, in the long run. So it, it doesn't really matter so much today that there is a big bus. It's actually helping yeah, to, yeah, to, get, it's helping, yeah. to get companies which are producing good hardware to, to get funded and to get product heard and stuff like this. But there is, okay, there are some products or some, some kind of hardware uh, challenges which require quantum uh, mentality or quantum mechanics. For example, is chip manufacturing. So this, uh, in the end, all the computation goes to the to the bits, right, or qubits yeah. in our case, and manufacturing of them require a lot of a lot of research and knowledge about quantum mechanics yeah. and uh, fundamental properties, how materials work and stuff like this. But in the end, in the end, the 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 end product or the end solution when all these challenges will be solved will be using uh, machines which were used for non-quantum stuff mm -hmm. like uh, thin film deposition or evaporators which are using mm -hmm. now they were using for to evaporate uh, i don't know silicon chips on your conventional computer as well so this kind of uh, yeah the hardware which is what the machines are using yeah. to produce quantum stuff they are the same as the machines which produce non-quantum stuff. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. No, you know, like I'm absolutely happy that the word quantum becomes very popular and people start using it more and more. I'm absolutely happy with that. So what I'm a bit afraid is that there is a, a misunderstanding from, let's say, public perspective that they think that the quantum computer is really powerful, it's really conquering the world, and it will be soon sold in the grocery stores. You know, so there is like a, 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 like a public mentality, which I, and it, it, it seems to me that some people really misunderstand it. They think that the quantum computers, first of all, they're coming soon, and they will solve like most of the problem in, in our, at least the like computational problems. But then I think if it's, it's important to mention that quantum computers, at least for now, they're designed to address very specific problems, for now, this is like still machines which takes rooms. It's it's not like I think people sometimes don't understand the scale. So I, I'm I'm coming from the background of neutral atoms, and for me, like machine takes like really a, a decent room, and it's it's complicated. You need at least a few engineers to walk around constantly. So it's not, it's it's already doing good things. It's already addressing challenging tasks in the modern physics, technology, and things like that. But it's very complicated, and uh, it's. It's not like ready to be like even an industrial product, maybe at least in neutral atoms. But I know that companies, some companies are working on that, and uh, I, I wish them most of the luck. So it's 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 really important that they are doing it. And I really happy that the word quantum becomes popular and people are really interested in in, in this. So for me, this this is very important. But what I'm afraid that this misunderstanding could cause some problems in the future, runs because people would expect. Oh, we created a quantum computer like okay so what it will solve and you're like it will solve some computational problems and this might be a big disappointment for some people that's what at least my fear is you know yeah i mean yeah first of all it's it's good i also agree that it's good uh, that the, the physics problems get a lot of attention <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we know good examples from the past that uh, it can help uh, the humanity to progress like exploration of space and yeah. uh, uh, development in in the material science that we know have now have good batteries and uh, yeah. cameras and uh, yeah. So, what I can share my vision, for example, how yeah. quantum computer can change our lives, and I'm sure it will be in small steps. 
yeah. first of all we should not expect that it will just break uh, everything and then we just have all everyone has quantum computers at home so yeah. what can be a solution which is kind of visible today is that it will be a service in the cloud mm. so as you know for example today many computational power is is outsourced to the clouds for mm. example we don't need a, a powerful pc at home just to play good games so if we have good internet connection then it can the computational power should can be outsourced in, on a server yeah. so you can imagine something similar in, in a quantum computation that let's say some companies want to develop new drug for example and they need to mm. do some simulation of a very complex molecular structure to see how to find the i don't know some energy levels of that so, and what what they're doing today is they either outsource the computational power or they buy a very expensive uh, high performance computer uh, and uh, do com calculations there. So what quantum computing can bring is that it can solve some equations or some of these kind of, let's say, yeah. for example, drug problems or uh, chemical yeah. problems, and it can be done on uh, on the cloud as a service so there's companies or researchers they can just yeah book a time on quantum computer yeah. and do the calculations so it seems like it can be like a small portion of yeah. high performance computing but actually the, the the power of quantum computer is estimated to be so large so in the in the long run it will expand this area so it will be not a small portion of high yeah. performance quantum computing but it will just occupy a much larger area and some examples can be for example animations or games yeah. when when you for example nowadays uh, gaming industry require a lot of computational power to calculate a lot of stuff and also hollywood movies they yeah. have a lot of special effects so these kind of problems might potentially take over taken by quantum computing yeah. power yeah, and actually now when I'm thinking about that, so what's the, what do you think the main problem of for the quantum computers to become really broadly spread out? So was they, why they're not really becoming a thing for everyday use? So is it like a problem of physical challenge? We don't have uh, like enough financial support. If, do, we don't have enough people. So what like in your perspective, the main problem, why the quantum computers don't go the full speed, let's say? Well, it's going as fast as it can already. So sure, but like if you want to speed <laughs> yes, it up, if you want to speed yes, it up, yes. how you would invest it? Let's say how you would improve it even to go even faster. Yeah, I mean, at least in my, I mean, there are many opinions there. So you have yeah. to see that everything is depending on the person who is speaking. So in my understanding, in the realization of quantum computing hardware, there are a few layers of challenges. Yeah. And one of them, one of the most important one is, is the processor. Let's say the, the chip, actual chip where the computational power goes. So this chip is today is kind of uh, very hard to manufacture, first of all. So then it's, it's, it's like basically it's nano layers of some metals depositing in, in a very complicated pattern. And often they break and then you, yeah, you need to reproduce them in, in a good way and scale. So the, the chip yeah. itself, the fabrication of chip itself is, is a complex problem. And it's not only problem of, of producing that, it's a problem of designing it. So to, to make sure that uh, there is a good choice of material, good pattern. And this actually, yeah, this is tackled by the, the most advanced, let's say, groups in the world and the corporations, and they're doing good job there. It just requires some extra time and possibly good people. Actually, yeah. the problem is the people. The people who has this knowledge, who can solve these problems, they're kind of limited because in the in, yeah, right now they're grown basically in research laboratories, which may be, I don't know, in fact, of, it's less than 100 laboratories in the world who can uh, train these people. Yeah. yeah, and uh, let's say the amount of, of qualified people is not that big to, to tackle. Yeah. And of course, it's slowly going up. And we can see now at universities, even at TU Delft, they have special courses on that, which were not there like five years ago. Yeah. So that's one, one challenge. And this is kind of a serious problem to, to, yeah. to, to solve. And then there are many other problems which are more technical. For example, the the error correction as we know today that if if we want to make a chip or a processor working effectively it should 
it should not produce certain amount of errors. The amount of errors produced during the calculation should not go go above certain number yeah. this number i don't know it's like one percent or maybe half percent yeah. so it means like every like from 100 calculations uh, the 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 chip does only uh, i don't know one out of 100 is a mistake so we, we really need to make sure that calculations are actually correct right yeah. and th this has been solved in, in in the silicon chips but not it was not solved yet on on uh, quantum chips yeah. And this is a problem not only of hardware, but also in, in the software part, how to run and, and filter out, let's say, the errors. Yeah. This is a, a big challenge. And then there is another big challenge is, is the actual surroundings and hardware surrounding the, the chip. Because today, the solutions we have today is that the chip has to be cold. Yeah. The temperatures are like... Uh, 15 millikelvin or 5 millikelvin so it's really really, really it's small, cold. small temperatures and there must be a lot of electronics yeah. coming either from room temperature but also at low temperatures sitting close to these chips because the, the frequencies they're working on are kind of unique right so they're high frequencies gigahertz so that's also requires extra challenges because then the the, yeah, the high frequency brings you more challenges in in a signal processing power and then because it's a cold temperatures we cannot use certain types of materials we have to think about thermal aspects of every electronics we bring at, at, at low temperatures Mm. And also reading out the signal, reading in, so bringing in the signal and reading it yeah. out. This is also a challenging task because yeah. of the space, basically space and thermal aspects. So these kind of things, they're popping up one by one. Once we solve yeah. one, there is another one coming immediately. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> and no. it's like a, yeah. it's like a escalating amount of of challenges. But yeah. again, these challenges are not fundamentally physics fundamental physics challenges these are the engineering challenges which in a way will be solved in, at some point yeah yes yeah, that's, that's and, I, and i think it's exactly my my perspective that's how i see it as well is there are it's not like there is one specific showstopper so we don't have like let's say it's not like a physical limitation it's not like people it's just a little bit of everything so yeah the problem is challenging but technically like there is no physical limit to it it's just just hard it just needs time it just it needs investment and effort yeah. and time yeah then in terms of like people and qualifications yeah more, more good people always better so we still and there are i think a number of good people but we have to probably uh bring even more people to this problem and i'm thinking not only about quantum engineers but even just good electric people who good with optics, with manufacturing, yes. like uh, circuits. So all types of people, all types of engineers would be very useful because the task is so challenging that there is a huge room for everybody. And especially if you want to address the difficult problem of quantum computing, it's really yes. a lot of small problems which needs to be addressed. So we need all types of engineers. Uh, then of course there is funding like investment and of course i guess like in the recent years the progress is relatively good so it's it's more and more money is invested in quantum fields but okay more money all this better so and instead of what i'm saying it seems like a problem which needs like lots of impact from different perspective and then gradually with over years it will become like really a quantum computer but what i see right now i don't think that one company this is my perspective i don't think that one company let's say like a google ibm or microsoft they can solve it by its own as, as you said as you'd be like let's say one company like big company which produce and final product but it will be like 10 maybe 20 maybe 30 small companies which supplies these big companies yes. in terms of like small things and then i think it's really a good probably i don't know it seems to me like it's a good time for uh, startups to start building up Do you, don't you think so is it like really yeah. good? It's it is a good time, and we see it that within the um, last couple of years, there are more and more names appearing. And just to 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 for comparison, like this year, uh, twenty twenty, is a is a weird year because we have uh, coronavirus and everything like uh, economy shut down. But yeah. if I look to the quantum computing ecosystem. We have uh, so many news that this startup get like uh, seventy million dollars investment. Another startup got thirty million. Another startup got acquired by big corporation. Yeah. So there is a lot of going on. 
and uh, corona for them is not even a stopper <laughs> people don't really they just keep doing their job and yeah. this industry is growing and uh, i don't know the numbers by heart but uh, mm. the the pace or the acceleration of amount of yeah. money coming into the quantum computing hardware and software companies is is i think it's double digit growth high maybe even yeah. three digit growth yeah <laughs> yeah but is it like don't you think it's a bit too risky in a sense like okay if let's say i have an option to invest in quantum computer or let's say standard high-tech companies which producing cell phones laptops whatever i i would be at least doubting because for me quantum computers yes it's really cool it's growing fast but the uh, possibility for success is a bit vogue in a sense like it's not nothing is guaranteed because the technology is too complicated yeah. so if let's say i have to choose between investment in quantum computers even if i'm coming from the background of quantum computing quantum computation technology is very close to my heart i'm still like will be a bit hesitating in the sense like well quantum computers are good but they're risky because i have a standard let's say chip manufacturing which producing chips for for years and they're gradually improving so they they produce a stable benefits over years. So I will be still doubting, you know, like, oh, should I go for quantum computers or should I go for the standard computers? Because it's mm -hmm. it's, it's it's risk, no? Don't you think so? It's always a risk. First of all, if it's investment, it's always a risk. And I, I understand that investors, they understand also the risks. Yeah. Uh, the, the thing is that uh, if you, for example, if you think from perspective of of really high profile investor or high profile uh, corporation which thinks in 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 the long terms yeah let's say in 10 years ahead or 20 years ahead so you have to understand that if you don't invest in certain technology and this technology grows exponentially high in the next 5 10 to 10 years so then the entrance to the market will be also <laughs> will also exponentially grow yeah. so if you today invest let's say 100 million dollars as a investor or corporation in certain area uh, and this somehow works out so then you can multiply yeah. these investments by factor with the three or four zeros in the future of course it's not working then it's, it's a problem but you probably still have engineers with the knowledge and stuff like yeah. this but if you invest uh, in the same area which which successfully proven in five years so then you need to invest not 100 millions but yeah. probably 10 billions or yeah. stuff like this. so that's the, the the logic which financial people understand so yeah, which, yeah. And, and now it's actually quite the interesting question at least for me is that quantum technology is really a broad spectrum of problems right yeah, yeah. and I, I, right now there are let's say there is 100 companies let's say 200 companies and my point is there is probably a room for a new company to grow and uh, so my point is don't you think it's a bit hard to, to start the company even there is like a huge demand okay there is a demand from uh big companies or from um just a research field that there is a demand for a new product but still i think that the startups are not growing as fast as they could be right it's just like there are lots of problems to address and probably we can see like hundreds of startups every year but it's just it's hard to build a startup i think in terms of like in the field of quantum computers even if there is like a lot of challenges to address it's still mm -hmm. i think it's just a bit risky in my perspective i don't know what's the showstopper for this case but it seems to me that it's just too risky but i, I don't have like yeah. uh, it's always risky but i mean some risks can be calculated or taken yeah. into account I would say that if if uh, uh, there is like a researcher or, or or even not researcher but engineer who knows how to solve certain tasks and they think or they, they can see perspectively that this the solution can be applied in for example some sort of uh, solving a problem in hardware for quantum computers yeah. this will be always welcomed in the industry yeah. because there are so many challenges that players are welcoming <laughs> new players yeah. to solve the tasks yeah. because again one company cannot solve all the problems and yeah. even within one domain let's say the optical domain there will be many many challenges like how yeah. to make the reproducible lenses in a large scale and uh, stuff like this or just with the cables yeah. what we solving in our companies like cables were always there and nobody even thought that this is a problem 
But yeah. in fact, it is a problem if you want to put 10,000 cables into the small dilution refrigerator. It is yeah. a problem. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And like, like yeah. Th there are so many small, small things which can be solved. And it's, I'm only talking about hardware, but there is a big, big stack of software problems, which are still, let's say, if I, I look to the, yeah, the code of quantum computing software platforms, it's very hard to understand. This is kind of assembler of, 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 of conventional code. So that's, the, the code is so primitive and it's so low level. So that it communicates with the, let's say the bits themselves. So there has to be made another code or another I don't know language which can communicate with this code, which communicates with other code. Yeah. So yeah. The, the, the level of problems is so fun so big that yeah. there are many uh, yeah, possibilities for companies yeah. and I can give you a few examples of which problems uh, can be solved but maybe it's another topic. <laughs> another topic. Yeah actually like in one thing which I want to mention is that for me there is one maybe like showstopper is I think there are lots of good products in research labs and from from my field it's a good laser and one research group develops a good laser right but it never thinks about this group never thinks about bringing it really commercially and maybe it thinks like some way deeply in their heart but let's say they develop a laser and then the point is you have to transfer this laser from the lab to really industrial products and yeah. I understand that but the problem in my perspective researchers don't usually think about transferring it from lab to industry and even if because in, in my field, let's say, I, I know that there are 10 labs which are creating lasers for themselves. And, but then there is no like final product. It's, if you combine the efforts, let's say, of these 10 labs, you can create one good, really, laser for very specific tasks, but it will be very good if you combine expertise from 10 labs. But then just nobody do it. And this is like, <coughs> for me, it's really yeah. a showstopper because if somebody creates a good technology somewhere in the lab, and now you're like, okay, Maybe it should be like a startup. I don't know how to do it, like yeah, really yeah, in terms yeah. of bureaucracy, yeah. but it would be really nice to transfer it to industry, right? Yes. So it's actually 50% of my time, what I'm spending at work is, is all about this. It's called uh, improving yields. So yield is, is the factor which determines your success in, in production of hardware. For example, you as a researcher or any talented researcher can make a very good laser, one prototype, and it works amazing. And he yeah. spends uh, 10 months on making that. So how to make from this prototype yeah. to product, which goes to hundreds of them sold, let's say, and that's the industry buys it and everybody wants this product and you make it in, in a way that it, it, it costs you not 10 months to produce, but one month or yeah. even smaller and each, laser is the same as previous one yeah so that's the problem of uh, of of companies of let's say industrialization of their of their production and this is not a problem of scientists and if you're a scientist and you want to do solve that it's better to hire professionals <laughs> who know how to tackle these problems because uh, we always think in terms of having a perfect product but what's matter is it's how how company or startup make a product which is good enough for industry. It does need to be perfect. It just need to be good enough to be able to to sell it with the price which affordable to co other companies who will use it. And uh, in the end, so the market will tell you what what, what they need. Yeah. So by talking to your potential customers or existing customers, you basically you will learn what kind of product they need. And then, yeah, the, the good entrepreneur, let's say, or the CEO of the company, he would able, or the, let's say, they would be able to summarize what industry wants, let's say, which product, to sum up all the, let's say, wishes and create end product, which probably will not be this, the most perfect laser on earth, yeah. but it will be working laser, which everybody wants, and it should be cheap. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> That's the magic. And the successful entrepreneurs, they they were able to solve these problems, to go from yeah. the a uh, perfect product to the product which is good enough and cheap enough or yeah. maybe expensive enough. But that's, it's, it's just 
Yeah. Yeah. This is very very complex uh, uh, process, oh. and in the end, let's say uh, what we are using all all day nowadays, every way in our normal lives, all the computers and smartphones, they're not perfect, but we're yeah. using them. We know that the battery dies within twenty four hours, right? We just accept this fact, and we always charge our phones. Yeah. We know that you can make a battery which works for one month probably, but it will be so expensive or so heavy or so big that you just cannot afford that. Yeah. So, okay, we just live with that. We know we can do better, but fine. So we know yeah. that cars drive using diesel and it, it's bad for environment, but we still drive them because we know that it works. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's, 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 it still works. So yeah. It's, it's the same with technology. Once, yeah. You develop something which is working and uh, let's say affordable, then you will have a customers. You will have a lot of customers. So. Yeah, yeah. Actually, I our time I think is coming to the end, so I, I want to wrap it up. But to finish it, I would say yeah. I I hope that in more products will leave the research labs because uh, I I worked in a few research labs and I know that constantly people developing small things, but they never leave the lab. And for me, it's like a bit of a heart wrenching. So it's like, ah, this could be a nice product. And you know, I know that people like in the nearby institute developing something like that, maybe be different. And if you combine the efforts, I think it will be really good lasers, but for whatever reason, people don't talk or don't share. I don't know what's actually the, the problem, but in my eyes, if it will be like more common efforts, it, 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 we could develop a better products for the better future, I would say. So it's, I think it's, it's a nice point to stop. I thank you for the joining me today. It was a really thank interesting you. discussion. I really enjoyed yeah, it. Thank you. Me too. It's it fun. Okay. Thank you.